Hi, Calc friends. Welcome to section 5.4, Indefinite Integrals. Last section, we talked about definite integrals. All definite integrals have integration limits at the top and the bottom of the integration sign. Um, and when we evaluate a definite integral, we always get a numeric value. Today, we're going to talk about indefinite integrals. Indefinite integrals do not have integration limits. And when we evaluate them, we get what we call a family of function. So let's find the general indefinite integral of the cosine. So when we're doing indefinite integrals, it's not much different than doing definite integrals because our, the first step is when we do a definite integral is to find a function whose derivative is the integrand. So we're looking for a function whose derivative is the integrand. So in this case, we know that the derivative of the sine is the cosine. We take the derivative of the sine, we get the cosine. But our work is almost done, not quite yet. When we're looking for a general antiderivative, we're looking for a family of functions that is an infinite collection or the infinite collection of functions whose derivative is the cosine of x. So don't forget, we can add on, if we think back, whoops, to chapter 4.9, when we talked about antiderivatives, um, we can always tag on a plus c because when we take the derivative now, the derivative of that constant is just going to be zero. So we can check. take the derivative of our answer and we get the cosine of x plus zero which is the cosine of x which is our integrand so we know we're done so therefore the indefinite integral of the cosine of x or we say just the integral of the cosine of x is sine x plus c don't forget the plus c All right a few reminders um, about definite integrals. We can distribute an integral through a definite integral through a sum, a difference, and we can pull a constant out front. These rules also apply to indefinite integrals. So we can write them again without those integration limits. And the result is um, going to be the same. So in other words, we can distribute an indefinite integral through a sum, a difference, and we can pull a constant out front. So the integral of a sum of functions it's just the integral of the sum. So we can integrate each piece individually. The integral of the difference is just the difference of the integrals. And we have a constant times a function. We can pull the constant out front and then just integrate the function. So now we typically just do this sort of in our heads as opposed to writing it all out in most cases. So let's suppose we're given this example. Find the general indefinite integral of the cosine minus the sine. So in this case, we would do the indefinite integral of the cosine. Like we can think this, the indefinite integral of the cosine minus the indefinite integral of the sine. Well, the indefinite integral of the cosine is the sine of x. Now we could put on a plus c here, but we tend to kind of, we could put a plus constant here and plus a constant here, but what we do is we group them together and just put one constant on the end. So then minus, what function's derivative is the sine of x? Well, be careful here, because if you just said the cosine of x, right, the derivative of the cosine is the negative sine, so we actually need the negative right here, plus c. So my answer would be the sine of x plus the cosine of x plus c. Now again, generally I would skip this step, not take the time to write that out, and I would just say the antiderivative of the cosine is the sine minus the antiderivative of the sine, which would be the negative cosine, and that would become plus cosine plus c. And then don't forget, remember, you can check, right? The sine of x plus the cosine of x plus c. So how good you are at integration really depends on how good you are at differentiation. The, uh, the derivative of the sine is the cosine of x plus, well, the derivative of the cosine is the negative sine of x plus zero, which is what we started with, cosine of x minus the sine of x. Uh, that's it, all right, here we go. All right, let's keep going. Let's find the general antiderivative of two x. 
So we're looking for the family of function, the infinite collection of functions whose derivative is 2x. Well, hopefully you said x squared, but then don't forget to drag on our integration constant. This is really important. Don't forget that. And we can check. The derivative of x squared plus c is just 2x plus 0, which is 2x. And that's what we started with. So this would be our answer. The indefinite integral of 2x, so we just say the integral of 2x with respect to x is x squared plus any constant c. Let's find the general indefinite integral. All right, friendly reminder. The derivative of a product is not the product of the derivatives. We cannot just take the derivative of the first and the derivative of the second. That's not true. It's the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Right, so that is the derivative of a product is not the product of the derivatives. Don't do this. Right. So likewise, for antiderivatives, we have a rule that says we can separate integrals with addition, subtraction, we can pull a constant out front. Notice nothing here is said about products. The integral of a product is not the product of the integrals. It's not true. So what would we do in this case? Well, notice very simply, x squared x cubed dx is really just x to the fifth dx. And the antiderivative of x to the fifth is 1 6 x to the six plus c. We can mentally check that, bring the six out front. That's why we needed the one sixth out front. Leave the variable alone, drop the power by one. We get our x to the fifth. And then the plus c is just the arbitrary constant on the end. So this is our answer. Note, don't do this. If you were to integrate x squared x cubed dx and you were to try to separate it into x squared dx, x cubed dx, we would get one third x cubed times one fourth x to the fourth plus c, which is one twelfth x to the seventh plus c, right? Now let's take the derivative because it needs to be x squared times x cubed, which would be x to the fifth, but when we bring the power out front and drop the power by one, we do not get that integrand. So you may not integrate a product by integrating each piece. It's just not true. Unfortunately, there's not a nice product rule for integrals. Um, we talk a lot about that in Calc 2. Right. Likewise, there is no quotient rule for integrals. You may not integrate a quotient by integrating the top and the bottom. It is not true. So we look for simple solutions, like in this case, to rewrite it into something we can integrate. Notice that seeing we have the sum in the numerator and a mon monomial in the denominator, we can just write this as x cubed over x plus four over x, just using algebra. And now we simplify x cubed over x is just x squared plus four over x dx. And now we can just integrate we can integrate a sum. The integral of x squared is 1 third x cubed. The integral of 4 over x is 4, natural log. And I'm going to be proper. We should use the absolute values. We'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later in another section. But technically, because if, our, if we're integrating over a negative integral, then we can't take the natural log of negative numbers. So this is a formality. I don't penalize you at this point in the game if you forget the absolute values. So now we could take the derivative of this and check, and we'll see that it, um, it does give us back the simplified version of the integrand. 
So you may not integrate a product by integrating each piece and you may not integrate a quotient by integrating the top and the bottom. Do not do that. It is not true. So that's all the indefinite integral is. All right, let's just talk a little bit about um, the net change theorem. The net change theorem says, the integral of a rate of change is called the net change. So if we know how something is changing, we can determine how much it changed. So the integral of a rate of change, a rate of change is a derivative, is the net change. So if we integrate a rate of change, what is it, which is a derivative? We're just going to get the original function. And it's just how that function has changed from the lower limit to the bottom limit. In particular, whoops, that should be if an object moves along a straight line with position function s, then its velocity is the derivative of s. So given a position function, its derivative is the velocity. The net change of position or displacement from time equals t1 to t2 is what's going to be we're going to integrate the velocity which is the same thing as integrating the derivative of the position function. But when we integrate a derivative, we just get the original function back. So it's going to be the placement at the upper limit minus the placement at the lower limit. Also, acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. So if we integrate an acceleration, We are just integrating the derivative of the velocity. So that's telling us how the velocity changes over that interval. All right. So here's just a little example to get you started. There's a couple of these in your homework. Giving the acceleration of a particle. Oh, I got a little friend. Given the acceleration of a particle, A is 3t plus 4 meters per second squared, and the initial velocity is 2 meters per second, find the distance traveled over the first 5 seconds. So we're looking for the distance. So it goes distance, acceleration, or distance, velocity, acceleration. So we're at acceleration, we want to work back up to the distance. So we know that the derivative of the velocity is the acceleration. Right, so we know the derivative of the velocity is 3t plus 4. So knowing that, we can find the velocity because we just integrate the velocity, which is equivalent to integrating the acceleration, which is equivalent to integrating 3t plus 4. When we integrate 3t plus 4, we get 3t squared over 2 plus 4t plus our arbitrary constant. Don't forget your integration constant. Now we want to use this information right here to find the value of the constant. We know initially when time is zero, the velocity is two. So we put in zero wherever we see t. And we know that must equal two. Zero plus zero plus c equals two, c equals two. So therefore, the velocity is three t squared over two plus four t plus two. So now if we want to find the distance traveled, we just integrate, so we're looking over the first five seconds from zero to five, we can integrate the velocity. All right, so let's be really careful with this. The antiderivative of 3t squared over 2. Well, let's think. That's 3 halves is the constant out front, and we're just integrating t squared. Well, the antiderivative of t squared is 1 third t cubed. Plus, what function's derivative is 4t? 2t squared. And the function whose antiderivative is 2 is 2t. Two and we're going to evaluate that from 0 to 5. 
we're going to stick in our upper limit of integration. Oops, I have my ceiling fan on today. So it's going to be 1 half times 5 cubed, which is 125, plus 2 times 25, plus 2 times 5, right? minus, well, it's going to be this whole thing is what we get by sticking in 5, and then when we stick in 0, we can see right across the board we get 0. So the total distance traveled is 122.5 meters. All right, so definite integrals, we have lint integration limits, indefinite integrals, we eliminate the integration limits, and we're looking for functions whose derivative is the integrand. So really, you did this back at the end of chapter four, we're just assigning it a notation now. All right, kids, have fun.